U.S. Central Bank Aided Sex Trafficker In the 1830s, Franklin and Armfield was the largest and most successful domestic slave trading firm in the United States. The firm made each of its two founders, Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, one of the wealthiest men in America. Until Franklin and Armfield started its slave trading operation, the slave trading business was disreputable and considered a fly-by-night industry. Slave traders operated out of hotels and taverns instead of offices. Slave trading was not a profession, but an activity done on a temporary basis in order to make ends meet. The partners, Franklin and Armfield, turned the slave trading business into big business. The partners founded their firm in 1828 with, the equivalent in today's dollars, of $500,000 in startup capital. Franklin and Armfield had business lines of credit issued by the Second Bank of the United States and other major banks. The Second Bank of the United States was a central bank headquartered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In 1816, Congress passed a bill creating the Second Bank of the United States, which President James Madison signed. The Second Bank of the United States issued loans using slaves as collateral. Ironically, major banks like J.P. Morgan have recently apologized for being indirectly involved in the domestic slave trade. Historian Edward E. Baptist found that Franklin and Armfield drew up to $40,000 at a time from the Second Bank of the United States to buy more slaves in the Chesapeake Bay region. Baptist estimated that about 5% of all the commercial credit handled by the bank in 1831 to 1832 passed at some point through the hands of Franklin and Armfield. The Second Bank of the United States had branches in 25 locations that included Baltimore, Maryland, New Orleans, Louisiana and Natchez, Mississippi. The locations of these bank branches were convenient for the Franklin and Armfield slave trading operations. The firm purchased slaves in the Chesapeake Bay region and sold slaves in New Orleans and Natchez. The firm's headquarters was on Duke Street in Alexandria, Virginia. John Armfield took up residence at the Alexandria headquarters and oversaw the purchase of slaves. On a daily basis, the firm advertised for slaves in several Washington area newspapers. The ads read, Cash for Negroes and Cash in Market. The ad also stated that the firm was interested in purchasing 100 or more slaves. Franklin and Armfield employed a vast network of agents and sub-agents who worked on commission. These headhunters scoured the Chesapeake Bay region, more than 20,000 square miles, seeking to purchase enslaved men and women between the ages of 12 and 25. The firm used its lines of credit to purchase hundreds of slaves at a time for cash from slave owners in the Chesapeake Bay region. Many of these slave owners were in financial distress due to declining tobacco production. When enough slaves were purchased, the firm transported these slaves to New Orleans and Natchez using its own fleet of three sailing ships. The firm owned facilities in New Orleans and Natchez to hold and sell slaves. Isaac Franklin lived in Natchez and later New Orleans and he oversaw the sale of slaves. In New Orleans and Natchez, the firm sold these slaves to slave owners on credit and made an enormous profit. Then, Franklin and Armfield repeated the cycle again and again. Using their lines of credit, Franklin and Armfield dramatically increased the number of slaves that could be purchased in the Chesapeake Bay region and sold in either New Orleans or Natchez at an enormous profit. As Franklin stated, his firm can get money when no other trader can obtain a dollar. Franklin and Armfield sold 1,000 to 1,500 slaves annually in New Orleans and Natchez. And over the course of the firm's nine-year existence, approximately 10,000 slaves were sold in New Orleans and Natchez. No other slave trading firm even came close. Rape culture. Letters that the partners wrote to each other suggest that both Franklin and Armfield engaged in the systematic rape and abuse of the female slaves in their custody. The partners sought young, light-skinned female slaves for their customers and their own personal sexual gratification. The partners joked about having sexual intercourse with the female slaves in their custody. The partners also prided themselves in knowing what their customers desired. Slave traders called a young, light-skinned, female slave a fancy girl. The fancy girl trade was very lucrative. The firm could easily make a 100% profit on the sale of a fancy girl. 
Franklin and Armfield's goal was to supply fancy girls to its customers in the Deep South for the explicit purpose of sexual exploitation. The firm purchased young, light-skinned women who they believed could bring them big profits at auction in the Deep South. Fancy girls were the most expensive category of female slave at slave auctions in places like New Orleans. Fancy girls sold for four to five times what a female field laborer would sell for at auction. Fancy girls on occasion could sell for as much or more than a prime male field laborer. Using its lines of credit, Franklin and Armfield would purchase young light-skinned, female slaves from slave owners in Virginia and Maryland. Once in the firm's custody, these young female slaves were routinely raped by the firm's staff. These female slaves would likely end up as prostitutes or concubines. Franklin and Armfield referred to themselves as robbers and pirates. They referred to themselves as one-eyed men, a euphemism for their penises. The partners obtained young female slaves for their customers in the Deep South, but also for their own sexual gratification.